Hey folks, Darren with Fervent Astronomy. Today I've got a bit of an odd one. It's the Sigma 100 to 400 f5 to 6.3 DG DN for, in this case, Sony E mount, but I believe also like a L mount. Something is clicking in my head to say that it's also available on Fuji X mount. That being said, why am I reviewing kind of a mid range telephoto lens, uh, telephoto zoom for astrophotography? Well, Someone's going to watch it, and I have it, and I may as well. And if I'm being honest, that's all it takes. As far as telephoto zooms go, it's actually fairly light. This one, you can see, has the optional tripod mount here with an Arca Swiss plate. Stock, they ship with like a rubber band. Yeah, this one, nice and chunky. We've got a focus lock switch here, which allows us to lock it at 100 millimeters. And of course, it extends out here quite far, external zoom. We've got AF MF switch, we've got a focus limiter, a customizable button, and this one is a stabilized lens, so you do get two different types of stabilization. Not important for astrophotography, but I've been told that a lot of astrophotographers actually do bird and wildlife photography as well. I'm sure a lot of, a lot of you, let's be honest, if you look like me and you got some gray hair, there's a chance that you're getting into birds more and more for some inexplicable reason. And you might wonder if this is something that could pull double duty. Well, we're going to find out. Overall, the construction's pretty good. We've got a fair amount of good material here. It does feel metal. This is a plastic hood, but it does have a ribbing here around the edge. And more importantly, it's got this kind of dimple or channel around so you can do a push-pull zoom. Not very important for astrophotography, mind you, but you know, useful if you are doing wildlife. And overall, it's kind of what one might consider middling or compromised lens. It's much more compact than something like 150 to 600. You still get capped at that 6.3 aperture here at the long end, but you do have f5 at the short end, so it's not terrible. And overall, this is not going to be anyone's primary choice for astrophotography, but if you already are planning to buy this lens or have this lens, it might be good to know if it performs or how it performs for astrophotography. So without further ado, let's check that out. Howdy folks, welcome to Lightroom. Here we have a couple samples from a lens that's probably not very good at astrophotography, but we're gonna, we'll see. Uh, I say this because we're looking at samples from the Sigma 100 to 400 f5 to 6.3 DG DN OS contemporary zoom lens launched by Sigma in 2020. It is a variable aperture zoom lens, and a lot of what I just said usually goes along with poor optical performance when used for astrophotography. It's a fact of life. But another fact of life is that this is a fairly cromulent lens, a fairly affordable lens, and typically when you find yourself looking for an affordable option, good enough can be good enough. So let's see how this particular lens performs. These shots are all 60 second tracked exposures done with the Sony a7R Mark V, 60 megapixel camera, so this is really going to push things to their limit. All of these samples are shot at ISO 320. This is the A7R Mark V's second base ISO. It's a dual gain camera, dual gain sensor, and essentially that makes it ISO invariant. What does any of that mean? Well, it means that I can shoot the same image at 320 as I can at 3200, get the same noise, I can get the same ability to recover the shadows, but if I shoot at the lower ISO, the base ISO, I can get better highlight retention, possibly. Possibly. So if I'm shooting bright stars, for instance, or maybe galaxy, or maybe a star forming region, I can possibly retain some of that highlight information in the ISO 320 file that I can recover, whereas the ISO 3200 file, I will not be able to recover it. Why is this? Well, the camera is essentially just digitally boosting the brightness and then locking the file in at that brightness and that might push the highlights off the end of the right side of the histogram and clip them and that's no good so 
That's why I do that. If you want to learn more about that or get a better explanation, there's a link in the description. It will bring you back to Fervent Astronomy's website where you'll find a link to a wonderful article about that written by very smart people who are not me. You'll also find more information about the mount that was used to track these samples, the Fornax Mounts Light Track 2, because Fervent Astronomy, wouldn't you know it, is Fornax Mounts North American distributor. So you can get in some information about that. You'll also find a link to these samples, which you can download, which you can pixel peep which you can process if you want to. The only thing I ask you to do is please don't redistribute them online or otherwise, or post them online. Please don't misrepresent any of these files as your own. Please don't use them as the basis for your own review. Essentially, I'm asking you to respect my copyright. Use these images in good faith for the purpose they're being provided, which is the personal assessment of this lens's performance. And with that, let's just jump right in and see what we have. I've got the five major focal lengths or as close as I could get to them shot at whatever the lowest f-stop is at each of those focal lengths. So here I should mention I've also cranked the exposure a bunch. This is very slow f5 and 6.3 is not the fastest aperture uh, even with a 60 second track exposure. So just to have something to even look at I've had to crank the exposure. In the navigator here we can see that there's some vignetting happening in the corners and edges pretty typical. Overall, the center is a bit brighter. I don't suppose there's much contrast to be lost here. I think this is probably clean exposure. And if we zoom in on the center of the frame here, we can see right away we've got a little bit of chromatic aberration, a little bit of fringing here, this blue purple fringe. We do have a loss of contrast on around the bright stars though. This is perhaps a little bit of a manifestation of spherical aberration. Even though most of the lenses these days are aspherical or have aspherical elements, they're not perfect, so you will have this happen sometimes. Overall, it's not a big deal. Popping up into the corner here, we see what ends up being some not actually all that terrible astigmatism. Yes, dear viewer, this is not coma. Coma is a different type of aberration. Uh, and we come back over here, look around. I don't really think there's much, if any, to see. The closest I might say is you know, some of these stars, but coma is when you would get a star where the star itself, you know, has a defined edge and then the opposite edge bloats out into this kind of wedge shape and it gets fuzzy like a comet tail because coma is actually called comatic aberration named after coma from comets. So it's literally named after the comet tail. And what you'll find is you'll either get all of the coma pointing towards the center of the frame for internal coma or all of it radiating away for external coma. And in this case, while well, you can make an argument there's a little bit of loss of contrast on this edge and it could be the beginnings of coma i don't think it's an especially relevant amount but if we come back here this is classic astigmatism and if we move to some of the other corners here we got a really bad version here not so bad here in this corner not so bad in this corner so what is astigmatism well astigmatism happens in two different planes first you have tangential astigmatism which appears along radii from the center to the edges of the frame. So what you'll get is a lengthening of a star stretching out, usually more in the corners and edges, and that is along this radii from the center to the edge, tangential astigmatism. Basically the lens is having difficulty focusing all that light where it should be, and it stretches out. Exact same thing happens, but it's called sagittal astigmatism. It kind of happens in the opposite direction here, and it will sort of act to ring the frame as it you know, appears on all the, the various stars. And here, these small ones give you the most defined look. It looks like there's a little bit of widening along the midsection there. So that's probably, especially maybe this little yellow one, you can see it goes like this, and then a little bit here. That's your sagittal astigmatism. It kind of gives the little stars wings there. And when any of those things become an issue, for me is when I can see them messing the star shapes up or making the stars look bigger around the edges of the frame. In this case, I don't really see that happening. It's actually really well controlled. We do have this star. The brighter stars sometimes can get really wonky. This one's a little bit wonky. Here there's some additional fringing, that purple fringing here, but you know, even this star, if it's just a one-off, if you don't like the way it looks, you can clone it out or, or clean it up in Photoshop and just make it look all nice and pretty. That being said, the astigmatism, while it does come into the mid-frame a little bit, it's not actually bad enough to worry about. So I, I don't really see it affecting the images at all. We also have field curvature. And what is field curvature? Well, that's when you have 
one area, say the center in focus, but as you get towards the edges and corners, it goes out of focus. If you look at the relative size of stars in one part of the frame, and then you compare them to other parts of the frame, if it's looking detectably out of focus, that might be an issue. It might make stars look bigger. In this case, I don't see any field curvature, at least at this part of the zoom range. And we'll look at distortion and all that in a moment. So let's just scroll through the different focal lengths. 100, this is 136. Got as close as I could to the marks on the lens. Here we still have a fair amount of vignetting, especially on this corner for some reason. And overall, yeah, nothing that I noticed zoomed out like this. Here we have 196, which I guess I was probably trying to get 200, but it is what it is. Again, I'm not noticing anything zoomed out like this. 299, which was probably trying to get 300 millimeters. Again, looking pretty good. And 400. Definite loss of exposure up here. You can see the corner is quite dark. This is dominated by noise now, so it is what it is. We look into the center at 400. Things are a little bit fuzzier. There's a slight chance this is defocused a little bit, although pretty sure I was pretty careful about it, so it just might lose some resolution zoomed all the way in. Go back to 300 millimeters here, we see that things are, again, a little blurrier than they were, but really underexposed. Keep that in mind. At quote unquote 200 millimeters, roughly, things look a little sharper, a little more in focus. 135, yet again, you know, as things are benefiting from a relatively brighter aperture. And then here again, things look like they look. Let's look in the corner. Here we are at 100 millimeters f5. And as we zoom into 136 millimeters, most of that bad astigmatism is now gone or hidden. Although we are getting maybe a little bit more sagittal and almost no tangential, which gives the stars this kind of like flat look. Here, around 200 millimeters at 5.6. The astigmatism isn't that bad, but severely underexposed here in the corners. Around 300 millimeters, f6.3. Again, the astigmatism is not that bad, but we're losing a ton of exposure here, so things don't really show up all that great. And 400, same difference. We're zoomed in, the stars look bigger, which is usually a function of how bright they are, but we're not really gaining anything, and things are getting quite smushy. I'm really, I, I've made human errors before, but I'm not sure that defocusing was one of them. I think this might be what you can expect of this focal length, which, you know, when zoomed out is a different experience than when zoomed in. All right, let's pop into the develop module. And this fringing, we can probably jump right to the dropper and kind of kind of get some of it. You might have to adjust things manually a little bit. Here at 100 millimeters, if we enable corrections, we see that we were pin cushion distortion and we're correcting that, losing a little bit at the top and bottom of the frame, nothing really in the corners. We are getting a better vignetting correction here around the edges though. And if we scale down a little bit, you can see, yeah, most of the correction is happening on the top and bottom of the frame. Here, this is at nominally 135 millimeters. Again, we had pin cushion distortion. We're rectifying most of that vignetting, except whatever is happening here. This something is not right, basically, up in this corner. I have no idea why it's so dark. That doesn't make a ton of sense to me. If we look at what's supposed to be 200 millimeters. We enable our profile correction. Again, pin cushion distortion. Vignetting mostly taken care of. Again, that darkness that we just had in the, the one corner is kind of gone here. There's a little bit of vignetting still, but that can be fixed manually. This will be around 300 millimeters. Again, pin cushion distortion getting corrected. Things are so dark by this point that it is correcting some of the vignetting, but we're getting to the point where there's no information in the black. And lastly, at 400, pin cushion being corrected, vignetting trying to be corrected. But like I mentioned with the previous sample, yeah, here is a lot of noise, not a lot of exposure. So your mileage may vary. Overall, not terrible from my point of view in that the edges are not getting really wonky. 
So I think it's definitely usable. You might even be able to stack images taken with this lens, provided that some of these weirder stars or brighter stars are kind of corrected at some point. You really don't want them shifting around the frame. If they started off here, let's say the star was over here and it looked fine, but then shifted over here and started to go a little bit weird, that wouldn't be great for stacking that's going to mess things up a bit, given how things go towards the edges. But if you can keep things pretty much framed properly, you could probably use this lens for stacking. All right, well, I mean, for a budget zoom, that's not a bad showing. The thing I'd be most concerned about is that it's rather slow, but all things considered, you use what you got, and if this is what you got, and you have a decent tracker, I think this is a half-decent choice for a lot of things. So let's wrap this up. Well, you know what? This is not a lens of great surprises. I think it performs about as well as anyone might expect it to, given the fact that it is a sort of middle of the road zoom telephoto. But all in all, my mantra is just get out there, be under the night sky. So if this is the lens that you have, use this. Come on. Like it's better to do astrophotography than to think about doing it. So like I said, you've seen the samples. I'm not going to tell you what to do. It's up to you to make your own decision. So I really hope you found this useful. I'm Darren. This has been Fervent Astronomy. Thanks so much. Take care. And hopefully we'll see you in the next one.